Welcome to your video download CLE course. This course was created to meet the requirements of state bars throughout the country. Therefore, codes have been embedded in this course. There will be one numerical code in a one credit hour course. There may be multiple numerical codes for courses greater than one credit hour. To determine if you need these codes, please go to the My Courses page. If your state requires these codes to receive CLE credit, please write down the codes on a piece of paper. Even though you may be watching this course offline, you will need to log back onto the website to obtain your certificate of completion. Further instructions can be found on the My Courses page by clicking any of the blue question marks or the Instructions button. Hello, I'd like to welcome you to this CLE course on licensing. My name is Eric Hanscom. I'm a patent attorney with Intercontinental IP in Carlsbad, California. My name is Lionel Boscherberg. I'm a California and French attorney and I have a, a lots of experience in uh, licensing. So here's my, hence my present here. Hi, I'm Todd Langford. I'm also with Intercontinental IP and I'm a patent attorney here. So we're going to talk about licensing today. There are three things that an inventor can basically do with an invention and licensing is just one of the three. So for the general practitioner who has an inventor show up at his or her office, a lot of times the inventor will be questioning exactly what they can do to try to make money off their invention. Well, there are basically three ways that I've seen that people can do it. The first is they can make it and sell it themselves. The second is they can assign their patent rights to another company or to a person, as in they sell their patent rights. The third is a rental of their patent rights, which is a license. And so we're going to be covering the third of those, uh, which is licensing your patent rights to another person. First, though, let's go over some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different means by which an inventor can try to make money off their invention. So the first is making it and selling it yourself. Now, to a lot of the inventors, when they first walk into your office, they're going to say, well, I want to make it and sell it myself because then I get complete control and I get to keep all the profit. That's true. Uh, if you are the person who makes it and you're in charge of selling it and finding the retail outlets, that's true. You indeed do get to decide everything. You get to keep all the profit. However, you also get all the headaches. So real briefly, if you want to make it and sell it yourself, let's go through the, the timeline here. Uh, you've got a product. You probably shop it over to China, find a factory there that either makes that product or something similar, and you find the factory that basically has the assembly lines all set up to make it. So you have to go over there, find the factory, get them all set up to manufacture. And by the way, they want to get paid up front at least a third of the money before they start manufacturing. Once the products are finished, they're put in a container, usually a 20 or 40 foot container, thrown on a truck and taken across the border at Lo Wu into Hong Kong. Then they arrive at the freight forwarder. Now the freight forwarder's job is to take the containers and put them on the right boats heading over to California. Or if you happen to only buy several pallets worth, their job is to get your pallets into uh, a container that's going to Long Beach with uh, similar objects that aren't going to crush yours. So once the freight forwarder has done his or her job, the products are in the boat and they're heading over to California. Now back before the recent recession and the increase in gas prices, used to choose between fast boat and slow boat. Fast boat would generally make it from Hong Kong to Long Beach in 12, 13, 14 days. A slow boat generally would be about three weeks. Uh, well, boats happen to operate like automobiles, which means that they operate most efficiently at partial speed, not full speed. So right now the fast boats are taking about three weeks. Slow boats can take over a month, uh, which has caused a, a major change in the way that uh, small inventors are doing business with China in that somebody has to pay for all the time that product is sitting on a container ship going across the Pacific. And so anyway, it's not quite as efficient to get goods manufactured in China as it used to be because of all the time they're just sitting on the Pacific uh, traversing the route from Hong Kong to Long Beach. Now, once they get to Long Beach, they have to go through customs. And once they go through customs, some uh, retailers like you to ship it directly in the container to their headquarters. They then break it down, throw it into other uh, containers that go on trucks that go out to the retail locations. Others like you to break it down, in which case you, the inventor, have to have um, a, a warehouse, usually in El Segundo or Long Beach, and you have to handle that. You also have to be in charge of getting the product to a store, and uh, you have to have found a store that wants your product. Once you get the product to the store, you have to deal with all sorts of the intricacies of dealing with retail outlets, such as packaging requirements. Um, is the barcode the right place, the right size? 
Are there the right number of inner cartons for a master carton? Are the right number of products for an inner carton? Did the products arrive on time? And so there are all sorts of kind of rigmarole regulations you have to go through. Otherwise, most of the larger retailers will fine you uh, for failing to follow these. You have to have to deal with things like advertising allowances, product placement charges, and things like that. You also have to account for all the goods that are made. And so you want to compare the manufacturing records to the freight forwarders records, to the customs records, to the retailer sales. And if 50,000 products disappeared somewhere there, you want to find out where they went. Um, and there are a lot of unforeseen circumstances you also have to, have to deal with when you're dealing with retailers. So if your inventor wants to make it himself or herself and sell it, great, all the power to them. They get complete control. They get to keep all the money that's left over. However, it's going to become more than a full-time job for one person. So the second route they can go, they can do an assignment of patent rights. Now, an assignment is basically a sale. And so you may say, you know, I've got, I own the patent to this three-membered nutcracker right here. I'll sell it to you for half a million dollars. Now, assignments are usually the, the second most desirable um, alternative to people who come into your office because the idea of just selling patent rights and being done with it and just getting a big check is very desirable. The problem with that is that most inventors have a very twisted idea of how much their invention is worth versus how much somebody is going to buy the patent rights. So if somebody comes in with a patent on something and they say, I want a million dollars for it. Well, the prospective retailer is probably going to say, well, you've never sold one of these. How, how do I know it's going to work? I'm going to have to set up the factory. I'm going to have to do packaging. I'm, I'm going to have to market this. You know, I can't give you more than $5,000 for it at this point. And so often with assignments, you have a huge disparity between what an inventor thinks the invention is worth and what a retailer or a manufacturer or a packaging company or anybody else who might want to buy the patent rights thinks it's worth. As a result, assignments usually don't go through very easily. And if they do go through at all, uh, both sides are having to make major concessions. So the third alternative is licensing. And licensing is kind of meeting, both sides meet halfway. One of the attractive features of licensing is you can test market. It's kind of like uh, trial dating before you have to marry somebody in that you see how the relationship is going to work. You see if the person you're licensing your rights to uh, can sell as many as they say, and the person who's going to be selling the products and manufacturing them, they get to kind of test the market, see if it's going to sell before they have to commit any serious money to the inventor. So anyway, licensing is uh, often the third most attractive option to inventors, but it's often the one where they end up because they don't have the money to fund the whole thing themselves and because they can't find anyone willing to pay them for the invention what they think it's worth. But Eric, there's also some hybrid situation where you assign your patent, but in exchange of, uh, you know, let's say some uh, down payment and some royalty so that you uh, would be associated with, uh, you know, the success of the product yes. so that it's, uh, it's not a licensing, but it's close because you, so you are giving up the rights on the, on the patents, the ownership, yeah. but you can still benefit from, uh, uh, from, uh, the, uh, the success of the, the sales of, of, the, of the products. Sure, and I think you'd have to compare that to a licensing situation where you're not giving up your patent rights. You still have them, you're just letting somebody else manufacture and sell the object. And I, I find perhaps with a sophisticated inventor, they'd be up for an arrangement such as the one that you're suggesting. I find with a lot of inventors, they're very paranoid about giving up what they see as their rights because basically no matter how bad their invention is, they all think it's worth a million bucks. And so they're just saying, yeah, I can't give up my patent rights for this. But yeah, with a sophisticated inventor, I think that would be a good, a good And sometimes it's uh, also a business uh, model for non-practicing entity to, to come and say, oh, you have some, a very nice uh, patent. Let me help you. Um, give me the, the property of the patent. I'm going to uh, uh, pay all the, um, you know, the fees, you know, and, you know. Sure. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's also one of the things that uh, is an advantage to License to assign is who pays uh, for the for the for the fees for the sure. uh, for the U.S. Uh, PTO and when you extend uh, internationally, so the 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 so the non-practicing entity uh, would come and say, look, uh, give me the patent and I would monetize it for you. You yeah. would uh, uh, with uh, I have strong uh, arms and I can get uh, you know lots of uh, uh, money because I'm a professional in the licensing. Sure. 
so that's also uh, something that uh, sometimes comes up of uh, you know the assigning the pattern but to 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 get some uh, some some return uh, through um, you know the uh, royalties and especially for a small inventor often going to a company that's uh, does this as a profession is a good route to go because oftentimes an inventor will not be good at inventing getting it made doing the business end of things. They're better off finding somebody who can take over their invention partway through and trying exactly. to turn it into some turn it into some dollars. Now the other thing that goes on whenever you're dealing with assigning your rights and who pays the prosecution fees, what countries do you file in, I think you have to be very clear about who controls that and who pays for it. Because mm -hmm. obviously as an inventor, you don't want to leave all the decisions with uh, your your uh, assignee because they may say something, well, we want to file a surfboard patent in Mongolia, and you're the surfer, and you're saying, no, no, it's never going to sell. And they're saying, well, I'm sorry, we're going to file it anyway. And by the way, we're taking that off of the net profit, so you're not going to get as much. So you want to maintain some control at the same time. I think it behooves the inventor to approach such a relationship with the thought in mind that they're having to go to somebody to buy their rights because they don't have the money to do it themselves. So they, they may want to listen to the company and hopefully combine their knowledge to create a successful business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are some certain uh, situations where licensing is really your only option, like software. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you invent something, you just can't, you know, you're not going to necessarily assign each individual piece of code to the user. You have to license it. So sometimes, you know, you say it's a third option. Sometimes it's the only option. <laughs> That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah, if you're an average software developer, do you have the money to write the entire program? process it, do all the marketing. I mean, I, you know, a lot of, I know that I think software licenses, they get on the average 7 to 11% or something like that. Do you want to take that and have Microsoft or Apple's clout behind marketing your product, or do you want to try to do it yourself on eBay? I'd rather take, I'd rather take 1% of what Microsoft could do than try to, you know, hassle with selling it out of eBay and having the, the packages be in my garage. That'd be kind of a bummer. So when we talk about licensing, one of the important things is to decide what do you have that you're going to license out. I remember a conversation I had about eight years ago with somebody who said, well, I'm just going to license out to uh, an investor. And I said, what were you going to license out? And they responded, well, that's a good question. Okay, that's the kind of thing you probably should figure out before you're going to decide you're going to license out something is what do you have that you're going to license out. Now, we're going to limit this to intellectual property, but with respect to intellectual property, you can license out your patent rights basically at any stage of the patent prosecution from I just filed on this with a provisional to I have an issued patent in my hands. Uh, you can license out a trademark. You can license out copyrights. Basically, any type of intellectual property, you can license it out. So to at, at the risk of boring the NEIP attorneys who happen to be watching, um, <laughs> A patent gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling the invention in the country in which the patent was granted. So uh, for this little device, this is a three-member nutcracker. Um, the client in this case got a utility patent on how it works and a design patent on how it looks. We've also got a mouse pad here. This is made by the company called Funk. Uh, this is trademarked so that everybody knows this is a Funk mouse pad as opposed to being a Microsoft or an Apple mouse pad. So trademark protects a brand identity. Then we pulled this book off our shelves. This is called Selected Commercial Statutes 2006 edition. Probably not the most entertaining thing around. But anyway, uh, they did copyright at least a portion of this book. So a copyright protects artistic creations, which in its traditional sense would involve books and magazines and musical performances and things like that. For your average inventor, you want to remember that a copyright can also be used to protect a website, packaging, owner's materials, things like that. Basically, anything associated with an invention that could be called art, you can protect with a copyright. So you general practitioners and business attorneys, when you have the uh, clients come into your office and you start talking about their options, and they say, oh, copy, I don't need a copyright. That's just for Rolling Stones and the Beatles. You say, no, actually it can protect your website. And that's, again, especially in this day and age, one of the most valuable things that you can have as an inventor is a website to show off basically what your product is all about. One other thing to consider with uh, what you have to license is whether you own it at all. <laughs> that's uh, true. You know, there are many clients that come in and they've got an idea or they've come up with some new design for something, but as it turns out, somebody else made the design. 
they paid somebody else for the artistic artwork or they paid somebody else for the actual inventive process. So when you're looking at what you can license out or assign or, or even manufacture yourself, you do have to be careful that you or your client actually owns that intellectual property before you attempt to license it out. And also when you are licensing in, you want to make sure that uh, you are licensing to the right uh, you know, party, that uh, you know, there's a clean you know, um, chain of title. Uh, otherwise, you, are, you will be paying for pretty much nothing. Exactly. So it's, uh, and also one of the, the things uh, as a due diligence is to make sure that uh, uh, when you want to manufacture something, um, you, uh, you have um, everything covered, you know, that uh, you may have to license in from someone else because, you know, it's also part of the, of the process. So that's uh, before licensing in and out, you have to make, you know, a determination of uh, what's at, uh, at, at, at stake in terms of the, of the rights and uh, who owns what. That's uh, definitely the right. first step before. Uh, what it is and do you even own it? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. And remember that a patent, to quote the statute, gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling. It doesn't mean that you can necessarily make it. You may need to get somebody else's license to make your product. So, yeah, you, you've got to figure out all these things. It all goes into a business decision. Is this worth it? What am I getting or what is my client getting out of, of this license? And does it make sense to go forward if I'm licensing technology? I need more technology to license before I can even make it. Okay. So the first thing you need when you're deciding to license is you need something to license. So presuming that you figured out what you have that you want to license out, you need to look for prospective licensees. And there are a number of ways that you can do this. Uh, I'm a big fan of trade shows. And I tell, a, especially a lot of our smaller inventors, I'll suggest they go on Global Sources or Alibaba or one of these Chinese sourcing websites and look at the trade show calendar and try to find some trade shows that are coming up uh, nearby. Now, in my opinion, anyway, the best trade shows are in Hong Kong. But here in Southern California, we have four decent trade show venues all within driving distance of San Diego County, where we're located, uh, San Diego, Orange County, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. And so I urge that they uh, look for some trade shows that are coming nearby, and then check out the exhibitor list to look for companies that are practicing similar technologies. Uh, these companies, they could be your competitors, they could be your licensees. Uh, so often, you want to start compiling a list, and I suggest people do this on an Excel sheet so they can alphabetize it, do that sort by row function, so they can keep looking. And if the same prospective licensees keep coming up time after time, that's probably somebody that they should try to meet by going to a trade show. And now, again, obviously, you want to be patent pending before you go to the trade show. Uh, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't have to say that, but I do. You'd be amazed how many situations uh, you, know, you, you hear about or you run into where Somebody says, yeah, I went to a trade show three years ago and I had a booth and uh, now I want to patent my invention. Can I? Well, probably not because you did a pretty major public disclosure at this trade show. You changed your invention any. But um, yeah, so you want to make sure that the timing's right there. And uh, so anyway, trade shows are a good way of figuring out some people you might want to uh, license to. Retail outlets are another good, uh, another good source. So if you happen to have invented something like this. This is a, uh, a salt shaker that has a beveled weighted top. So after you're finished shaking out your salt, you flip it right side up. The beveled edge just seals off the water vapor so you don't end up with a bunch of coagulated salt um, in your salt shaker. If this is your invention, well, you probably can go to Crate and Barrel, see who makes similar products. You could go to Costco. You could go to Walmart, Kmart, Vons, Ralph's, see who makes uh, these, these type of salt shakers. These could be the people you could try to, to, to license to. Now, when you're looking at a product, the other thing I think that's worth considering is you generally have four levels at which you can try to license. Um, the first, we'll just keep with this. The first is you could go to the actual manufacturer, which is a, a company in China that makes items similar to this. You could go to that company and say, hey, company, I've got the rights to a really cool new salt shaker. Would you like to take over these rights and start making this? Uh, you could also go to a packaging company. Now, I use the term packaging company to cover a company that doesn't make it and they don't sell it, but they put it in their packaging. So a packaging company goes over to China at a trade show. They look at the hundred or so products out there and they say, can you make these three for me? Here's what I want the packaging to look like. 
you know, crank me out a 20-foot container load will bring them over and try to sell them. So you could go to the packaging company. You could also go to the retailer. You could go to like a crate and barrel and say, hey, you want to be the only person who can make this. I don't care where you get it made. I don't care whether you put it in your packaging or your, your house brand's packaging. Just get it made and pay me. And then the last level at which you can, it isn't really a license, but you can try to sell it, is you can sell it yourself. And this is, you're talking about a fulfillment house or eBay, something like that. So there are a number of different levels at which you can try to, to license out a product. But when you say you uh, um, want to sell yourself, so that means that it's also the beauty of the, the licensing uh, is that you can also uh, reserve the right to sell. Mm -hmm. You can sure. just uh, uh, make sure that uh, you can you know, allow for certain territories, for certain you know, products, for certain markets. And so it's not uh, the um, all or nothing. You can just uh, adjust and fine tune according to the, the, the market needs, yeah. basically. Well, that's the great thing about licensing is that there are so many different options, so many different ways that you can form a license. You know, as you said, there's territories, exclusive, non-exclusive, time periods. You know, we'll get into a lot of this sure. stuff in a minute, but, um, you know, it, it really is almost the sky is the limit as to how you can, you know, uh, structure such a deal. You know, you may take care of everything but the actual selling part. Or you may have exactly. everybody else, you know, you license other people to do everything, then you just do the final selling yourself. So, as you say, so much you can I do. I tend to, uh, you know, object to the skies of the limit because you may have the antitrust laws as the limit <laughs> <laughs> in terms of what uh, you can do uh, in terms of... Uh, it's not uh, the universe, it's just the sky. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, the sky, right. okay. <laughs> So what, what I, I find often is when, when, when we're discussing these issues with, with clients is that I urge them to try to keep control over the things that they really like and they're really good at. These are not necessarily the same thing, unfortunately. But if you find a client who's really, they, they love traveling to China, they love overseeing factories, they love going to Hong Kong and having the fancy dinners and, and attending the trade show with their manufacturer. If they really love that, then maybe they're cut out for that. If they've never traveled outside of the United States before, probably overseeing factory management is not something that they're going to want to do. If they've got a family at home, that's what I hear quite frequently. Like, you know, like, I can go to Hong Kong, but only for a day. Well, okay, um, you're, you're not even going to be able to go there for a day. You're going to go there for 30 minutes, and you can't even get in, into Hong Kong from the airport in 30 minutes. So you're not cut out for that section of the invention process. But I think that's really worth doing is sitting down with your client and figuring out what do you like doing? What part of this are you good at? What can you do? And what can't you do? Yeah. yeah it's a, it all comes down to it. It's, it's a line from the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie where Captain Jack Sparrow turns the boom into the, the uh, uh, Will Turner character and he's out there hanging and Captain Jack Sparrow says it all comes down to what a man can do and what a man can't do. So it's got to be the same thing as a client. What can you do? What can't you do well? Did you get a license to use that, uh, that phrase? No, I didn't. It was a star use privilege. <laughs> Jason, you're going to cut that out, right? <laughs> so assuming now that you know what your client wants to license out and assuming that your client has found a prospective licensee. You have to prepare for approaching your prospective licensee kind of like an inventor would approach a potential investor. And the better prepared you are, the better a chance you have of landing a good licensing agreement. So if your client has prepared a provisional patent on elcheapoprovisionals.com and they have a, a prototype that they made in their garage with a hammer and a vise, and their business plan is basically, yeah, like I'm going to go out and sell this thing. You're probably not going to get a very good licensing deal. So, you know, in terms of the preparation you want to go through, what I always tell our clients is I suggest they look at a quick pitch competition. Uh, and there are a couple of good quick pitches uh, that I've seen here in San Diego County. We've got the Tech Coast Angels quick pitch, and then there's the Cal State, uh, University, Cal State University San Marcos quick pitch. And there in two minutes, these people have to have down basically an entire business plan. So I, I definitely think it's worth mentioning to your clients that they want to come up with a decent business plan because any prospective licensee is going to want to figure out what they're getting. And again, if they're getting a provisional patent that was written on the back of a napkin and a crummy little prototype, you're not going to get a very good offer. Whereas if you can convince the licensee that this is, it, maybe it isn't an ongoing business, but at least it's a proven product that it's got some good intellectual property in place. 
that you've t done your prototyping work with some quality engineering firms, you've gotten maybe the opinion of an engineer that this will indeed work, I think you're going to greatly enhance your chances that you're going to end up landing a licensing deal that your client will be happy with. But that's the situation where the, li the prospective licensee is not manufacturing or selling a product similar to what's in the scope of your patent yeah. because that is a completely different uh, sure. animal in terms of the approach. You yeah. have to be careful not <laughs> to uh, Very. threaten the prospective licensee, which also is a potential uh, infringer. Yeah. So you, you have to, uh, to uh, play it uh, very nicely with your patent attorney to make sure that you are not uh, going to trigger a reaction from the uh, prospective licensee slash uh, infringer yeah. that could, uh, you know, the, uh, launch a, a counterattack by the way of a declaratory, declaratory judgment. judgment. Yeah, that, yeah, you don't want to start a prospective licensing agreement having to defend against a declaratory judgment. That's for sure. But but yeah. we are, we are uh, what you are contemplating in more the situation of uh, you want to convince of a new invention, a new product, and. Someone yeah. with the takeover uh, hasn't thought about it, and sure. you you have to yeah. convince as an inv as an investor that yeah. it's a good, uh, solid, uh, you know, business uh, yeah. business plan. Yeah. But your point is a good one. It brings up another another point that I think that we probably need to reiterate here, and that is that your potential infringers, your potential copiers, they are also in many cases your best potential licensees, and so you do. As, you know, especially you're talking about patent rights, you do have to be careful going out there and rattling your sword. And there are unfortunately cases out there that basically say an invitation to a license can spawn a declaratory judgment. So, you know, exactly how do you word that 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 first approach? That's that's an important issue. So yes, now comes the fun stuff: the negotiation yes. of terms of the license. <laughs> Uh, the first thing I think we wanted to cover was basically exclusive versus non-exclusive rights. And to me, they seem like simple terms. It's exclusive or it's non-exclusive. You know, mm -hmm. it's solely this one thing or everybody gets to do it. But I feel like once you actually start to get down and look into what is exclusive and non-exclusive mean, it, it gets pretty interesting and pr pretty fun. So, you know, with I exclusive, what it sounds like is you can't sell basically more than the same thing twice. You know, you exclusively give somebody the rights to practice your invention. You cannot then grant those same rights again. Non-exclusive is pretty much the opposite. You can non-exclusively grant that same right multiple times to whoever you want to do it to. Where it gets a little bit fun is when you almost have these hybrid situations where I'm going to grant you an exclusive right to manufacture the goods in the United States. So that means that you can no longer grant that same right to somebody else to manufacture those same goods in the U.S., but that doesn't prevent you from licensing it to somebody in France. Right. Correct. Um, with an exclusive right, because you're, you're not allowing anybody else to do it, the royalty rates are often higher, right? Because they can basically say, I'm the exclusive yeah. licensee. I'm the only one that gets to do this. And obviously, on the other end, uh, the non-exclusive right means that you're going to have or potentially have another competitor. <laughs> so if I'm licensing something here to Lionel uh, and a non-exclusive license, he may go out there and say, hey, you know, I'm going to sell this product to, to all these people over here in Southern California. And then lo and behold, next week, I give that same non-exclusive license to Eric who floods the market with the product. So, you know, that's one of the things to think about when you're it's exclusive versus uh, non-exclusive. Um, and then the other thing that kind of popped into my head um, was if you grant an exclusive right to somebody, even if it's for a particular region, you probably want to have minimums or some kind of guarantees that they're actually going to make you money off of this license. So, for example, once again, I grant an exclusive license to Lionel this time to sell widgets in Southern California. And he says, thank you very much for this license. I will give you 10 cents a widget. Great. I think he's going to sell a whole bunch. And then he sits on his thumbs for two years and Absolutely. doesn't do anything, and there's nothing I can do <laughs> yeah. about it. Yeah. At the same time, if I were to grant him a non-exclusive license, he doesn't have to sell anything, but then I can go ahead and, once again, give it to Eric sure. and get my 10 cents a unit after that. There's also some hybrid situation where you give uh, some exclusive rights, but at the same time you reserve the right to, uh, uh, to sell yourself um, so that you still have the ability to uh, 
uh, to improve the product or to uh, to make sure that um, you know you, you still retain some uh, some uh, some control. That you know, you know it's uh, not completely you know it's not typical, but that uh, that could uh, happen. So when you uh, draft this uh, you know the ex the exclusive rights, you have to m to make sure that you know if you want to uh, to to be sure that uh, the 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 licensor is not going to uh, uh, to uh, also uh, uh, practice invention, you have to also to exclude that. Well, that's a very good point. You know, whether you're on the licensee or licensor side and you're dealing with an exclusive agreement, um, you really do have to, you know, clearly spell out, does the person that's licensing it also get to practice what they're licensing? Because if you just say, I'm going to grant you an exclusive license, in theory, that means that you can no longer do it, even though you're the one that owns the property. So now we can also talk about the scope of the license that's uh, granted, whether exclusive or non-exclusive. Um, and when we say scope of the license, uh, these, there are things like uh, making it, using it, selling it, and even modifying uh, the invention. So when you talk about a license to, um, to make, you can limit the license, the licensee, to only manufacturing the goods. So I could grant Lionel here a license to manufacture my widgets, but then he can't sell them. All he can do is make them. He might make them for other people. He might make them for me. Um, but he can only manufacture the goods. He can't actually sell them on the open market. But, but can I have someone else manufacture the, the products? Well, you know, the contract. I was actually going to get to that in just a minute <laughs> with uh, <laughs> distinctions of sub-licensing. You know, and that's another kind of different scope of the license is I may grant you the right to manufacture it. I may grant you the right to sell the goods. But that right may stop there in the sense that there's no sub-licensing, or there may be a sub-license included with it. And why is that important? Well, you know, as you pointed out, a manufacturer, I may grant you the right to make it, but you may not be able to make it. Or put another way, um, you may want to make some of it, but you may not have the capacity to make all of the goods. So if you're on the end of the licensee and you're getting a license to manufacture the goods, you might want to make sure that you also have the right to sub-license out your rights, such that if you become overwhelmed or incapacitated for whatever reason, you can still meet your obligations, whether it's to the license or to some other third party, um, through the use of the sublicense. But you know, most of the the companies in the U.S., you know, they don't have necessarily the, the their mm -hmm. facilities in the U.S. to manufacture. They have a partner in in China that uh, you know manufacture for them. So the um, it's. Uh, most of the time, you know, you need to uh, to have the uh, the sub license because um, you don't own your a fabulous company. You don't own any factory. You just have contract manufacturer that manufacture for you. So and uh, so then you you have to be the licensor has to be very careful about this because um, the the IPs could end up in the wrong <laughs> ends. Uh, and so how to protect you know uh, till the very end your your invention. I think you almost have to have the right to sublicense out in cases of larger appliances. For example, we talked earlier about how the fact that now a, a fast boat is making it over here in three weeks. A lot of the companies that make larger goods are making them down in Mexico, but they're not making them in Mexico. They're assembling them in Mexico from goods that are manufactured in China. So obviously, if you're taking a license from a, a refrigerator company or something like that, you don't want to have to make each individual little screw. If so, you're, you're well, you're kind of screwed. So... Yeah, it's probably not nothing that you really want to take on. And uh, sticking with sublicensing, there are certain things where you license that you do not want to sublicense. Software, for yeah. example. <laughs> you know, you want to give somebody the right to use the software, but you don't want to give them the right to also sublicense it out. Or basically, they can simply resell your product, your product simply being the license itself. And that also gets us to one of the other scopes, which is the use of the invention. Uh, when you're talking about uh, one of the scopes, you may give somebody the right to use a particular piece of intellectual property, and oftentimes this can be trademarks or copyrights, where they get the right to use your brand name to make their products. Um, we'll get into you know quality control a little bit later. Uh, but the use um, of the IP, once again, is often, I would say, associated with no sublicensing it, because you don't want to basically let anybody just simply reuse it unless you have some kind of royalty schedule or something like that that anticipates, you know, these people basically being a reseller for you. Yeah, yeah now if you just license it out to a sub-licensee, it's more or less like you're just using a middleman. And why use the middleman? Just go right to the sub-licensee right. if that's the person who's really going to be doing all the work. 
But there's also the you mentioned the the the, the right to modify, and that's <laughs> you know must sometimes you know you have some uh, uh, a license to develop the products, not necessarily that you can sell the products. You just uh, play with it, and so you just have a limited license to to develop. So when you are when you are you know uh, representing the the licensee, you have really to be careful about um, you know making sure that all the scope of license fits the needs of your of your of your client. Um, and uh, because it's everything that is not licensed, you cannot uh, you, you cannot have it. Well, the other issue you're dealing with there is if it happens to be an invention. If the licensee makes an improvement on it and there are other patent applications filed, the licensee's name really should go down as a co-inventor. And of course, absent a written agreement to the contrary, any inventor on a patent application can do with it whatever he wants or she wants. So you definitely have to have that built in that the, the, if there is an improvement made that the uh, licensee assigns their rights to the licensor and perhaps is compensated for any improvements that they make. But you need to have that covered. Yeah. You can't have your licensee just running around making improvements and, and worst of all filing their own patent applications and not including you on them. And I, and I think that's a, v a critical uh, issue because um, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, especially with technology, um, when you get a license, uh, you uh, want to improve and uh, you would uh, just fine tune maybe the manufacturing processes. So the, the license uh, wants to make sure that uh, uh, there's not going to be a leak in terms of the yeah. technology. But at the same time, uh, you want to reward the, the licensee to make a good job at sure. improving the, the, the invention. So could be the consideration could be giving a license back mm -hmm. um, to the, to the, uh, the license uh, saw for free, but allowing the, the, the licensee to, uh, to continue using the, the, the improvements yeah. that, is, uh, uh, that he has uh, is uh, originated. And once again, this, this gets back to the ownership issues as well. You know, you've got a licensee out there and they're modifying something. You have to make sure that you know who owns this new intellectual property that's being created. And, you know, once again, it's up to the parties to decide how it gets divvied up. Sometimes it goes to the licensor. Sometimes it's the benefit of the licensee. And as you say, there's a cross license back, as the case may be. So one of the other scopes that we can uh, delve into is um, kind of what level things get sold at. You've got brick and mortar stores. You go down to your local strip mall and perhaps you buy a pair of socks or a shirt or something like that with a particular brand. Uh, that can be more of the brick and mortar or the actual physical stores. And then with the internet these days, you've got e-commerce. You've got these web stores that are coming up. And it's not uncommon to have um, exclusive or non-exclusive licenses on these different scopes of whether you know you can sell it here in California and you can sell it through the regular brick and mortar stores and you set different price levels and whatnot for the brick and mortar stores and then separately have these e-commerce websites where they've got a completely different royalty schedule and scope themselves. It's a very important question about the, the market. What's the market for the products? Because you can segment the market in a way that uh, you could cover several different type of uh, licenses. Um, we are going to discuss, uh, you know, in a minute uh, the territory. But um, the one of the things that uh, a license could accomplish is really to make sure that you have uh, different markets being covered. Sometimes in a in a in a patent, you have several types of uh, applications, um, and uh, so some that are more valuable than others. Yeah, and so you can uh, with um, with uh, one patent uh, ad address several di completely. Uh, different uh, markets, and so you can give an exclusivity and uh, and certain manufacturing rights. While you can give uh, some uh, um, distribution uh, rights, uh, modification rights to another, uh, and it's two completely different uh, activities. So it's really uh, like you know uh, slicing you know very thin uh your piece of meat uh you have uh, <laughs> you, you have your meat the, the, the patent and you you can slice it any way you want um with the caveat that you have to 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 uh, uh to follow the the entire trust uh, and, uh yeah. rules and, yeah. uh, and not and not be uh, uh too much of a you know the a res a restriction of trade but uh um that's uh, uh that's um, important to to right. uh, to acknowledge the the, the a good analysis of, uh, of, of your market for the, the invention. 
So we're basically saying that you have a scope that you can set many various different ways and you can either exclusively give that to somebody else or non-exclusively give it to a whole bunch of people. The other thing I think that's interesting is um, as a practitioner, I think that oftentimes one of your, your, your main goals after you first make sure that the client understands what exactly they're trying to license out is to expand the horizons a little bit. I find very often, especially the smaller inventors, will come in with a very narrow idea of what their product is going to be good for, and they need to have that broadened a little bit so that they include all these possibilities. I think that's a really crucial role that the attorney can play, is especially if you've played this game for a while, you've seen things that have been sold in different channels and for different purposes, and you've looked at the different ways that you can license out an invention and make money, and I think that you can really do your client a favor by making sure they've at least considered or contemplated these things. Because many times the clients will walk in and they'll say, I know this guy, um, he wants to license my invention. Yeah. He's really excited about it. And when you ask them, you know, what terms they've talked about, well, you know, it's very simple. He just wants an exclusive worldwide license for everything. <laughs> We've heard you know, that before. You know, yeah. you know. And, and, Which you know, is simple. It, it's simple. Yeah. It's yeah. very simple to do, but at the same time, the clients don't often understand exactly what that means. And getting back to ownership, they don't necessarily have the worldwide rights no. to begin with or the ability to sell that. So another thing to be careful of. Yeah. One of the other uh, parts of the license agreement that you're going to want to tackle would be quality control. And this is particularly relevant in trademarks. Um, when you're talking about a source of the goods and identifying that source of the goods, you want to make sure that whatever is represented by that mark meets your quality standards. And there are certain legal things and trademarks that we can get into, but we'll, we'll save that for another discussion. Suffice it to say that it is important not only from a legal standard to make sure that you have quality control, but also just from a you know, business perspective. You know, whether it's you're making, using, or, or selling it, you want to make sure that whoever else is doing it is doing a good job. So for manufacturing, you want to make sure that they're manufacturing the goods for you or for somebody else according to your standards. And these standards might not only be you know, the quality of the product, but also to make sure that you're practicing the invention as you want them to practice it. Yeah, we've had situations where people start manufacturing and all of a sudden they're manufacturing outside of the patent claims. So are they truly licensing a patent if they're manufacturing outside of the claims? Well, that's, that's a good question. And in terms of the quality control, the other thing, as a practitioner, you really have to be careful of if you're dealing with overseas factories is oftentimes there's, there's sort, of, sort of a gradual bait and switch you're going to get where the first couple shipments of, of product are just... A1 standard, they're using the, the marvelous uh, components, they're making the products perfectly, and then you start noticing a drop-off in quality. And so you've really got to be careful of that, too, and make sure that once you spot these problems, that you, you go back and you rectify the problems before any more goods get out there with your client's brand on them. This often involves either a trip to Hong Kong or into China to, to check on the goods. It may also involve buying some sort of a, a, a trade agent over in Hong Kong who can actually visit the factory in mm -hmm. China, take a look at the assembly line and start pulling some goods off and testing them. And if there's a problem, send you over those cell phone pictures and say, hey, you know, your mouse is showing up here. The, the cords are, are, are coming two pieces. and You got to tie them together. Obviously, you got a problem. You need to rectify that before the goods start showing up on the shelves. And then from the licensee's perspective, you also want to make sure that whatever quality controls are put in place uh, the, with the agreement that you're signing, you want to make sure that you can meet those and that they're clearly spelled out so yeah. that there's no gray area. You don't want to be caught six months, nine months into the agreement, and they're now saying that all of these products don't meet yeah. the quality control that they spelled out. Because the quality control said, I have to like the products. Right. And I don't like your products anymore. Exactly. So right. I, I'm revoking the license. It just so happens I have a, another prospective licensee who's giving me twice as much, but that has nothing to do with it. I suddenly <laughs> decided I don't like your products, and there's and nothing I want you can do about it. Yeah. Exclusive agreement. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the uh, the key uh, element in uh, in a license uh, deal is uh, to to discuss about the the, the territory. Uh, the worldwide license is great, but uh, most of the time you want to approach it again with the view of uh, what's the market and uh, what the licensee could uh, offer in terms of uh, really uh, selling your products and uh, giving you the return through the, the, the royalties. So you, you, um, you have to define uh, the territory very precisely. Um, 
sometimes you know you 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 have some regions and it's uh, but uh, it it can be uh, uh, not necessarily addressing precisely what countries are in the in the region. So you need to to to, to spell out you know the the list of uh, of, uh, of countries. Uh, you um, you uh, you you have also to to bear in mind that uh, if you are you know let's say giving a license to one uh, country in Europe, uh, then there could be the question of the exhaustion of rights because the licensee can sell it and then once it's uh, sold in one country, it can circulate throughout the, the, the European Union. So the uh, uh, checking, you know, whether there's a, it's a regional bloc like the European Union, um, for the US, um, uh, you can split by you know states by uh, you know city. It's it all depends on on the uh, the type of uh, of rights that you're licensing and the type of products that you are marketing. Uh, but it's uh, uh, the more precise you are in the territory, the better because then you can uh, allocate another uh, the territory to someone else, and uh, and so it's kind of a puzzle. You need all, all the the pieces yeah. to, to really uh, to rematch. Yeah. And I think that's an important point about specifically uh, stating the territories. Uh, you know, some people just want to say, well, I'll do North America. Yeah. Um, and because they think, well, there's the U.S. And, and, and that's really just all that matters. And you'll give potentially an exclusive license to somebody in North America, uh, but all they do is sell it in the U.S. And then as it turns out, you've got other potential licensees in Canada or Mexico or even Central America. So it would behoove uh, whoever's drafting the agreement or the parties as they're going through it to make sure that they're not giving away too much, even though they're narrowly and carefully defining that region, that territory. It should really only be what they expect is needed by the licensee. Yeah. And you know, back to the exclusivity and also the uh, the string the strings attached to it, meaning uh, you want to have some quotas so that. Um, in let's say for a certain territory where you give some exclusivity, you need to define what are the objectives because as a licensor you want the best return. So if you are just giving you know uh, a free ride to someone who is going to do nothing uh, in a very large territory, that's not uh, good. So you have to really uh, be not not be lazy and really define precisely the the territory. Define the, uh, the 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 sales quota, the the way you want to to market the the or have your licensee market your your products. I think the other thing to take into consideration is oftentimes you'll be asking for a different royalty schedule depending upon whether or not you have intellectual property in that country. And so, for example, in North America, uh, you know, oftentimes what sells in the United States is going to sell in Canada because we have very similar buying habits. We share a lot of the same chain stores, but Mexico is an entire different ball of wax. What sells in the U.S. may not sell down in Mexico, and then Central America. Does it really pay to go down and get those trademarks and patents in El Salvador and Belize and Nicaragua and Panama? Probably not. And yet, do you want to just give those away as part of North America, or do you want to retain those and try to find somebody who's going to put a little more time into each of the Central American countries? But we almost uh, forgot. When you also grant a territory, you need also to check whether you have rights in this territory. Because you know, uh, sometimes you know you you think that um, it's okay just to have a, a trademark in uh, in the U.S. and you license your trademark <laughs> in uh, in Argentina. Sorry, you don't have a trademark. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, you don't own the trademark. Yeah, yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, it's important really to. Uh, to make sure that when you assign a territory, yeah. uh, the um, you uh, you know have the rights on uh, related to this territory. If I could just uh, no, go ahead. throw in a real quick practice tip too, if you happen to be re happen to be representing a company that's trying to either franchise out or find different distributors in different countries, my advice is never ever ever let that distributor get the trademark or get any intellectual property for your client because uh, we've had way too many situations where they'll actually put it in their own name 
so to the point where you try to fire the distributor, they say, well, that's fine. You can fire us, but we happen to own the name down here, so you have to do business in our country under a different name. And it sounds ridiculous, but we've seen it happen but, but way too many times. But it's very convenient. It is, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> the distributor is uh, happy to help. Oh, they are. They're more than, more than happy to help. I think also you need to look at the laws in each country in which you're doing business and look at exactly what kind of protections are built in for employees and distributors and agents. Uh, for example, Chile has some pretty harsh laws about firing people. And some countries in uh, Central America also have some very harsh laws. If you happen to be a foreign com company and you're firing your distributor, um, sometimes you have to pay them a year and a half average uh, royalties just to get rid of them. So you want to know that going in. And also, you sometimes you have to uh, register the license, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially with exclusive rights to the the equivalent of the USPTO yeah. uh, to make sure that you know you still have the the rights and you can enforce it against uh, uh, third parties, yeah. and and in certain countries you also have uh, licensing some an invention could be considered as a transfer of technology and so there's sometimes some rules I to tars. to yes to yeah. uh, uh, to uh, register to have to register the the the, the license as a yeah. transfer of technology. Yeah. I think it's probably also worth pointing out too that um, we've talked about you know worldwide license and things and things like that. With intellectual property, a U.S. copyright is recognized in most of the civilized countries in the world. Uh, a U.S. patent and use it trademark is only good in the United States. So when you're counseling a client on whether to do filing, obviously they don't want to file in every country in the world unless you happen to be a Microsoft or an Apple. It just is not cost effective. So. When we're counseling clients, usually we look at a few key factors, and this would include um, how many people live in the country, do the people have enough money to buy your product, culturally, are they going to buy your product, is the country going to enforce your intellectual property, and the other thing that sometimes we urge people to look at is if you happen to start a company, um, if you have a bunch of renegade employees that go off and start a competing company, where are they are they likely to set up right across the border in another country? But you need to take those things into consideration, and uh, not coincidentally, the retail countries, uh, usually in this order: the U.S., European Union, Japan, Canada, South Korea, Australia, South Africa, countries like that. They tend to be better at enforcing intellectual property rights than the developing manufacturing countries. So we usually urge our clients if they have enough money to try to patent and trademark outside of the U.S. to go for those other retail countries where their IP is more likely to be enforced. So with respect to royalties, there are a couple of ways that you can couch that. The first you can ask for is a fixed fee. Uh, you can ask for a fixed fee per time period. You can ask for a percentage uh, or what our favorite type of, of uh, license involves minimum quarterly royalties or a percentage of the gross sales, whichever is greater. I have never seen a situation where my client's been offered a percentage of net profit that I've found acceptable because it's so easy to bury money. And this is this is how it happens. But when you represent the licensee, that's good, right? Oh, it's great. Yeah, you love it then. But as a licensor, you want to avoid taking a percentage of net profit because it's so easy to bury money overseas when you're a manufacturing concern that it's very easy to show a net profit of next to zero. So we like, again, uh, a minimum quarterly royalty or a percentage of gross sales, whichever is greater. Now, the reason you want quarterly royalties instead of annual royalties is twofold. First of all, if uh, if your, your licensee goes bankrupt uh, December 15th, if you're doing quarterly, you just get burned for three months of royalties. If you're doing annually, you're waiting for that royalty check to show up December 31st, and instead you get a notice from the bankruptcy court. That's That's a real bummer. Uh, the second reason is, with a lot of products, they have hot and cold sales periods. So, mm -hmm. for example, surfboards, they sell really nicely in spring and summer when the water's warm. And we've got a lot of tourists visiting us to try surfing. They sell very poorly in fall and winter uh, uh, with respect to the cold water, the fact you have to wear a wetsuit to go out, and we don't have as many tourists visiting us. So, if you happen to represent a surfboard manufacturer, you want those minimum quarterly royalties in fall and winter when the surfboards aren't selling so well, but when the surfboards are selling off the racks in spring and summer, you want to be pulling in that percentage of gross sales. The ski industry is the exact opposite. Skis sell really well in fall and winter, but for anyone who skis, you know in spring and summer they're having fire sales 
on whatever didn't sell over winter. So, you know, if, if you don't care about the color of your ski and there aren't any huge advancements in technology, spring and summer is when to buy your skis, but there isn't a whole lot of profit built in there. So if you're representing somebody in the ski industry, you want to be pulling that percentage of the gross in fall and winter, but you want to at least be able to rely on your, your minimum quarterly royalties uh, late spring and summer. And as a licensee, you want to basically watch out for the opposite, exactly. which is make sure that you can meet those minimums, and that's something that you can you know, plan for throughout the year, because even if you're not selling those goods, you would still owe the licensor those royalty fees. Yeah. So you'd want to be clear with the, li the, the licensor up ahead saying, hey, okay, we know skis are not going to be selling well in spring and summer, so we want the minimums during those two periods to be really, really low. And that would be a reasonable request. Or a reduced royalty rate. Sure. Since you've got to sell them for half price anyways. Absolutely. Yeah. So the other thing you want to make sure that you get is audit rights. And I urge, you know, the licensee really should do an audit at least once every few years. An audit won't cost you a whole lot of money. And it's a good way to make sure that people are being honest about things. Uh, I've seen a couple of situations where uh, 50,000 goods just suddenly disappeared and then we had an excuse that uh, they went to South America. Well, South America has a very different warranty situation we have here in the U.S. South America is traditionally known as a black hole because goods go down there and they never come back. Uh, once a good is sold, it's sold, and there's no warranty on it. There's no guarantee. It's not like Costco where you can bring something back six months later and say, you know, this didn't work very well five months and 30 days after I bought it, so I want to return it. In South America, once you know, once the money exchanges hands, uh, it's, it's yours. And so, you know, you really have to keep on top of the, the audit rights to make sure that the same number are being produced as they're being sold. And so what you want to do when you audit somebody's books is you want to look at the manufacturing records over in China and make sure those jive with the, the, uh, the customs records at Lo Wu. If you bring something across the border into Hong Kong, it's usually trucked across the border at Lo Wu. Freight forwarders should show the same number of goods showing up in a container getting on the ship. Customs, U.S. Customs should show the same number of goods coming off the ship going to the retailer. The retailer should be able to account for where all these goods went. And again, what you're looking for here is you're looking for disappearing goods that they don't have to pay any kind of royalties on. And uh, there's a, I uh, always you know, see in, in the audit trials the the, the cost of the audit, you know, when there's a discrepancy of yeah. more than five or ten percent, then it, the, the the cost shifts to the yeah. uh, to the licensee. Right. Yeah. And so, if if you're a licensor, uh, you probably want to enter into negotiations by saying, so, you know, what what's the worst your books have ever been off? And the uh, the licensee is probably going to say, well, you know, a hundredth of one percent. Well, then you say, well, then you have no problem signing this portion of the licensing agreement that says that if your books are off by more than 3%, you'll pay for the audit. Likewise. And the difference. And the difference, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Times three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise, if you're the licensee, you want to be darn sure that you're keeping accurate books so you don't get this stuck in your face um, if, if the other side decides to, to license you. So the other thing that you want to be sure that you do when you draft a licensing agreement is have very clear language that handles the termination of the licensing agreement. Now, normally, if you've built into the licensing agreement that there are minimum quantities or minimum royalties that have to be made, if the other party fails to attain those, uh, there's usually a notice provision where you give them notice that you have violated the contract. You give a cure period, 30 days, 60 days, something like that, where the other side can make good and pay the money that was owed. If not, the contract or the agreement is terminated. Now, I want to use the surfboard industry as an example here of how you have to be very clear what happens with goods that are partially produced um, at the point when you terminate. Now, to make a surfboard, which I've, I actually made about 35 surfboards when I was a teenager. Oh, really? uh, yeah, I, I did. I wasn't very good at it, which is why I'm an attorney. <laughs> you took them 35 times. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, well, I have a patent attorney instead of a surfboard manufacturer. <laughs> but um, you take a foam blank and you shape that down into a shape. Then you put some rice paper on that has the surfer's insignia. So if you happen to re represent a famous surfer, you put that on the, the foam. Then you put fiberglass over it and you use a laminating resin to attach the fiberglass to the board. Then over the laminating coat, you put a surfacing coat. You sand that down nice and, nice and smooth. Over that, you put a gloss coat. 
then use a buffer to rub that out, make the board nice and shiny. Then you put some plastic strips around the edge so the board doesn't get dinged up, throw it, well, put it in a truck and take it out to the surf shops. So let's say you're representing a famous surfer whose brand name is on some boards and you have to fire uh, your licensee because they're not meeting the minimums. What do you do with the boards the licensee is finished that are on the truck getting ready to go to the surf shop? Well, let's let them sell those because they're already made, get to the surf shop, money goes to the li prior licensee, you get your cut of it. What about the boards that are already fiberglass? They have your famous surfer's logo down there on the board. Well, let's let them finish them up too. Okay, put the sanding coat on, sand it down, gloss coat, get them out to the surf shops. Well, what about the boards that have already been shaped with your famous surfer's particular shape and you've got a bunch of rice papers lying around. Okay, let's let them finish those up too. Let's be good guys here. The problem is your successor licensee is going to say, hey, you know, I bought this license for your famous surfers brand and the first six months all I had to do is I had to fight fire sale boards that are being sold by your previous licensee and they're still making them, man. They're still using your, your, your they're still using all those rice papers. They're bringing in more blanks. They're shaping them down and they're selling them at wholesale prices, but they just want to unload this stuff. And so I want my money back on my license because I can't sell these things at a profit. So you have to be very, very clear what happens to goods that are partially manufactured. And you know, one, this is, this is not a one size fits all solution, but one that might fit here is upon termination. The prior licensee has one month to finish up and sell everything they have. Otherwise, whatever isn't sold, whatever isn't in the surf shop at, as of one month after termination uh, goes at wholesale to the successor licensee. And that way you have a very clear delineation between um, when the pre previous licensee can sell stuff and when the successor licensee can sell stuff. Because remember, if you fire your licensee, You've got to, you, you're hoping you're going to have a better relationship with the successor, but it's really bad to start that relationship off of them having to, to fight a bunch of mer merchandise that's for sale at wholesale prices. Another thing with uh, the, the term of the license itself, uh, and I've seen this with patent licenses, is where the term of the license doesn't really match up with the term of the patent. <laughs> So in other words, the patent expires, yeah. but there's language that states that the term extends beyond that. Yeah. And there might be certain situations where the parties desire that you know, to happen, where I continue to pay royalties even after the patent expires. But oftentimes it creates confusion in the sense that there's really no termination of the license agreement, but the patent expires or has expired. And what do the parties do? So it's always good to, to, to take note of what IP you're licensing, when that IP might expire, um, and make sure that your term of the agreement matches that intellectual property. Yeah, but sometimes things are mixed up because you have a license on the patent, on the trademark, on the know-how, yeah. and that's where you know you, when you pay the royalties, you need also to know for what exactly is uh, you know the the rights that you uh, you know you're paying. Uh, or different territories, or different one territories. patent expires in one territory, yeah. but it's still valid in another. That's true. A U.S. design patent uh, expires 14 years after the date of issue, but a European design patent, you can extend that's li the lifetime of one of those up to 25 years by paying maintenance fees. So, yeah, when it expires is, is certainly important. I think as a general theory, if you run a good business, initially, a lot of the value of the business is in the patented technology. Hopefully, by the time you're either selling the business or by the time your patents are expiring, the value of your business is in your trademark and the brand recognition. So, I, I mean, I remember seeing a list in Forbes of the 10 most valuable trademarks. And like Google's trademark was worth, I think, 27% of its market cap value. So with a big business like a, like a Google or a Wells Fargo or, or a Ferrari, so much of the value of the business is in the trademark that by the time the patents expire, okay, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. You still have something worth selling and worth licensing out. But from the licensee's perspective, especially if you have minimums involved, you don't want to be obligated to continue to pay these minimums when now your competitors can practice that same invention in your territory. For free. For free, yeah. without having to pay a license. And because of your patent, they've gotten a blueprint of exactly yep. how to make it. There's nothing you can do to stop them. And even with trademarks, you want to make sure that whoever you're licensing the trademark from maintains their trademark to make sure that it's still yeah. registered in those particular territories. And what happens if a patent is canceled? Well, what happens? Yeah. What happens if it's litigated? Who pays for it? Who gets the money? If somebody infringes your patent, does the licensee or the licensor bring the lawsuit? 
who has to pay for it, who picks the law firm, who gets who gets any resulting judgment if if a a, a reexamination is required or or filed for on your patent where somebody's basically trying to destroy your patent, who has to pay for the defense? Who gets to pick the law firm? Who decides when enough money has been spent? These are all very important things that need to be discussed and covered ahead of time because you don't want to be in a situation where you get that reexamination notice and both sides throw up their hands and say, well, I don't know who's going to pay for this and I don't want to pay for it, but right. I want to keep my patent. Yeah, but at the same time, when the patent is terminated, then you would think that the 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 right to pay the uh, the or the right to be paid is also terminated. If I'm the licensee. I'm certainly going to want that. So that's also sometimes you know the that's also the question of uh, whether or not you put in a, in a license agreement uh, a clause that you would not challenge the the right that is uh, being licensed. Yeah, good for one side, not so good for the other. Right, but, yeah. but um, it, and it may not be uh, it, it. It may not work for all the rights. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, uh, you. You have to be very careful about uh, inserting uh, such type of uh, clauses. The course code is two, two, four. The course code is two, two, four. Well, it's I, been I, it's been fun discussing this with you guys. Yeah, it has. It has. Uh, licensing can it's, be. Uh, it can be a fun little game to play, yeah. you know, especially between both sides, licensor, licensee, making sure that everything's spelled out the way that your client should want it. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes educating the client is part of the part of the process. And it, but it's also great. It's a really great tool to monetize your invention because uh, you know spending uh, lots of money with you guys is one <laughs> thing, but trying to monetize and that's also the purpose of uh, really, um, you know. Uh, having a, a nice patent, a nice trademark is to monetize, and licensing is really um, uh, the tool to to achieve this. Uh, a flexible this goal. tool. A flexible tool, and you know, and we may have to, you know, to say one thing: is that licensing is not just one license agreement. You know, you can have, uh, not, you know, in very complex agreements, you know, uh, a license, uh, you know, clause that uh, just give you the the, the rights to do certain things. Uh, it's uh, it's all about having the rights and giving an ability to someone else to use, to make, to uh, adapt, to uh, uh, to sell. So, uh, but it, it's very flexible. But you have to be very precise on what you're granting. Uh, um, that's yeah. you know the the message is not to be lazy on this. A licensing agreement is a lot like a patent. Uh, the terms are incredibly important and. Um, as with patents, uh, especially if you're doing them in foreign languages, you have to be very careful about the words that are used. I know we've done a fair amount of work for um, various entities in other countries, and sometimes we'll get uh, some translations that are very, very difficult to follow, to put it diplomatically. And because the words you use in a patent can be so crucial to whether or not it's enforceable or whether it's valid or invalid, uh, likewise, with licensing agreements, it pays to have a really good translation done of these documents to make sure that you're not ending up with a, a foreign document that, that really is not doing what you want it to do. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, CLE on licensing, and I hope we didn't put you to sleep too badly. So thanks again for watching.